You may remain seated. Our sermon text this morning is our first lesson from 1 Kings chapter 17, the story of Elijah, the account of how God provided for him through those ravens and through the widow at Zarephath, and I'll kind of be walking our way through the sermon, or through that account throughout the sermon. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear children of our gracious and giving Heavenly Father, a wise older pastor once taught me a neat idea <clears throat> to help in your personal Bible reading. He said that it's very helpful while you're reading God's Word, especially those familiar and storied accounts like Jesus' ministry and, and Genesis, those, those accounts from the Old Testament, to stop in the middle of maybe even the most familiar stories to you from the Bible and pause for a moment and think, what would I have done if I were in God's position? It's kind of like, what would Jesus do? You know that old cliche phrase, uh, sometimes abbreviated WWJD, where you use Jesus as your example to encourage you in godly living. You think, what, what would Jesus do if he were in my situation? Well, this is kind of flipped on its head, the complete opposite. Put yourselves in God's situation in the story and ask yourself, what would I have done if I were God at that point. And again, this is a good idea for you to do at home in your personal Bible readings. I think if you do that and, and stop and think about that, you'll recognize time and time again that you would not have done things the way that God did them in his word. And if you do this, practice this regularly, I think you'll grow in your appreciation for how different and higher and, and holier our God is than we are, how much greater in wisdom. And also you'll grow in your appreciation for even those familiar stories that maybe have become drab after hearing them time and time again. And I'm going to ask you to do that right now in this account of Elijah in our sermon text. For the moment, put yourself in God's position. His prophet Elijah has just gone to speak to Ahab, the king of Israel. But Ahab was a wicked king and led the people of Israel away from the Lord to worship the false god Baal, who, by the way, who was, was supposed to be the, the god of rain, who would send rain on their land. Another god that Ahab led and his wicked wife Jezebel led the people after and away from the Lord was Asherah, who was a fertility goddess who would was supposed to make your, your cows calve and make the seed sprout in the fields. You see the symbolism here when Elijah goes up to him and says, there will be no more rain except at my word. Elijah was standing up for the Lord, our creator, the God of heaven and earth who is truly in control of the rain and the dew and the crops and the cattle. And he would show his dominance over these false gods. So Elijah has gone and confronted wicked King Ahab, and now there will be no more rain. So we stop and we think, what would you have done if you had been in God's situation? How would you provide for the people who trusted in you? How would you provide especially for the prophet Elijah? You could have done a lot of things, couldn't you? You could... Uh, Elijah was from Tishbe and Gilead. You could send rain just over Tishbe and Gilead. Sometimes it seems like God does that sometimes, doesn't he? Where it rains a lot here, but four miles away, not a drop. God could have sent rain over Elijah's house so that he had rain for his crops and for his garden and food to eat. That would have been one idea. God could have taken Elijah and sent him far, far away to Egypt or Persia and then allowed the rain and food to continue in that land. But God didn't do either of those things. God sent Elijah to a brook in the Kerith Ravine, which really wasn't that far away from Samaria where King Ahab was living. And he told him to hide there. And as part of God's plan, he was going to send ravens to bring bread and meat to Elijah while he was hiding? What a strange and odd plan 
our God has come up with. Ravens are scavengers. They usually don't share their food with anyone. And how are these ravens going to get bread to bring to Elijah? We don't know. God caused these birds to go against their nature and to do what he commanded and to provide for his prophet. There were also other people in Israel at this time who suffered under this famine, who trusted in the Lord and, and believed in him as their savior. How did God provide for them? I'll leave that up to you to continue reading in, in 1 Kings, the next chapter, chapter 18, we, we find out how God provided for a hundred prophets by turning one of Ahab's own men against him. And I'll leave you, that for you to read later on today. The Lord graciously provides for those who trust in him. And we can see that all throughout the Bible, how great God takes care of his people. We think probably, first of all, of the Israelites wandering through the desert where there was no food to grow. They weren't in places long enough to grow food sometimes. Their cattle that they brought with them would quickly wane if they started eating them so quickly. God provided manna and quail for them. When they were thirsty, he made water come out of a rock. In the New Testament, Jesus took a little boy's lunch, just a few loaves of bread and some fish, and made food enough for for maybe even 15,000 people in one place. But God's providence for his people is not always miraculous and it's not always immediate either. We have some examples like that in the Bible. Abraham in the Old Testament left behind his family, his homeland, left it all and moved to follow the Lord and obey his commands. And God graciously provided for Abraham. He became a very rich and wealthy man. Paul, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he was a rising Jewish hero. He lived in in some of the upper classes of his country and he gave all of that up to follow the Lord and become his missionary, essentially a wandering nomad without house or home, without really a job most of the time that would provide for his needs and God graciously provided for him. It wasn't always abundant, But he always had what he needed. In fact, the the Apostle Paul tells us, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He wrote those words to the Christians in a church in the city of Philippi because they had out of the generosity of their heart sent an offering and even some members of their congregation to come help Paul in his need. God graciously provided for Paul but no matter how much he had whether he was hungry or well fed he knew he had enough because he had the Lord and that was all he truly needed. How about you? How has God graciously chosen to provide for all of your needs? He's given you the ability to work, to earn a living, to provide for yourself and possibly even for your family. Or maybe you have a spouse or parents who have provided the things that you need so that your refrigerator is full of food, so that you have money in your pocket to go to the store and buy the food that you need. You have clothes to wear, shoes on your feet, and perhaps even a little cash set aside for a rainy day. Every night of your life, you've had a roof over your head and a place to sleep. He has also blessed us in other ways with a relatively stable government that provides a small but very, very useful for many people income so that people can sustain themselves. He's also blessed us with a relatively stable banking system where we can take some of the excess money that we have and set it aside and even grow that investment for a time in the future when we may not be able to provide for our own livelihood. All these are blessings from our God and he can easily take them away. Many times we forget that these blessings that we have come from him, from his perfect loving wisdom and from his almighty hand. And when we forget that, when we forget where these blessings come from, we often grumble and complain 
about the things that we don't have, the things that we wish we had, the things that other people had that we're jealous of. And we forget when we grumble and complain about these things, we're actually grumbling against our God. Sometimes in these situations, he helps us to appreciate those blessings and remember why, where they come from by taking them away from us for a time. An injury may cost you time or pay at work. We've all seen the stock market go up and come back down again, and many people lose lots and lots of money. Just like Elijah at times, God kind of holds us on the edge to make it completely and blatantly and sometimes even painfully obvious that we are dependent on him and his gifts at all time. He is the one who provides for our needs. But he does that so that we always have the comfort of knowing that our blessings continue to come from him. Whether we're living in plenty or in want. We'll have that trust as long as we remember where our blessings come from. But then God's blessing of Elijah hit a snag. That brook in the ravine dried up because there was still no rain. And let's stop again and think for a moment. Once the brook dried up, what would you have done if you were God? We all know what God is able to do. The Bible tells us of how he brought water out of the rock. Surely he could have made a little spring bubble up just enough for Elijah to get a drink there in the ravine. But God made a different decision than you and I might make. His time of teaching Elijah in this way was over. And he was about to bring his blessing, his teaching, to someone else, this widow of Zarephath. I don't believe that the brook drying up was a snag in God's plan at all. Jesus talked about the widow of Zarephath in Luke chapter 4. And he shows very clearly that this was not plan B for God. This was part of God's plan. That he chose this woman in particular to provide for Elijah's needs. And he calls his people in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. He calls them to repentance by showing them this woman who wasn't even an Israelite demonstrating great trusting faith in our Lord to provide for her needs. And he calls us to repentance too for our lack of trust by showing us this woman's trust in him. You'd think God could have picked a more likely candidate. She was a widow a poor, destitute widow who had nothing left in her house, nothing left to give, we might say. She was so destitute and her situation was so hopeless, she had even given up her hope for living. She had resolved herself and her own son's life that because they had nothing left, they were going to go home and eat one last meal and die of starvation. Now God picked this woman to provide for his prophet Elijah too? Every time I read this account of the prophet Elijah, I can't help but wonder how cruel those words must have sounded to this widow when she first heard them. Bring me a glass of water. Well, there's lack of water everywhere, and she's going to do it. And then even after she tells Elijah about her situation, that she has no food, that she and her son are going to die of starvation very soon, he has the gall to ask her, make a cake of bread for me first, and then feed yourself and your son. Put yourself in her situation for a moment. How would you feel? Someone asks you to give up your very last meal. On top of that, widows in general, in normal society at that time, widows were living in poverty. If they lost their husband, they often had very little or no income whatsoever. There were certainly people in Zarephath who had more money than this, women, this woman did. There were probably people in Zarephath who still had food left to spare. And God comes and approaches her. Why would he ask her? 
and to give to Elijah first in order for this woman to do what Elijah asked her to do she was going to have to trust completely that the Lord who gave his word to Elijah was going to keep his promise and she demonstrated that trust and the Lord kept his promise and maintained the oil and the flour until the famine was over but God did brazenly ask her to give him her first fruits. How brazen of our God to ask us to give him our first fruits too. Doesn't he know? Doesn't he know that we have bills to pay? Doesn't he know how hard we scrimp and save to pull together the money? to provide for ourselves and our family? Doesn't he know that we have children to feed? Doesn't he know what else you could be buying with the check that you lay in the offerings plate? Doesn't he know how much it is, how much it costs to give him our first fruits? What a sacrifice that is? Yes, of course he knows. He knows even better than you do. He gave you his first fruits. He gave you his one and only son. When we, the human race, fell into sin, God had a decision to make. He could have spared himself from the trouble of giving up his own son and coming to earth and becoming one of us and suffering the torment of hell in our place. He could have given us up and said, oh, forget it, you guys brought this on yourselves. You're going to suffer for eternity. But he didn't. He put us first and put his son on the cross so that you were bought back with the precious blood of Christ. He became poor like one of us. He bled and died so that you could be blessed and live in God's blessed presence forever. He wanted to be able to shower his love on you forever and ever and and pour his grace out and show you how much he loves you for time and for eternity. Yes, our God knows how hard it is to make those kinds of sacrifices, and yet he still asks you to trust in him and to give him first from what you have. That means as you go through your family budget each month, you don't start by saying, okay, well, this much I need for mortgage or rent and this much I need for food and this much I need for my car payment and cable, phone, internet and a few repairs around the house and on the car and okay, now let's see what's left for the Lord. Imagine one of the citizens of the kingdom standing in front of the king, fishing through their pockets to find something in the lint to give to their king. God asks for our first fruits. And when you trust in his promise that he will provide for all of your needs that you have left, he promises he will keep that. He wants you to consider the work of the gospel first, demonstrating that trust like the widow of Zarephath, like the widow in the New Testament who gave her last mites to the Lord, fearing, loving, and trusting in him above all things. Let me let you in on a little secret. When your motivation is showing love and thanks to the Lord for all he has done for you, for rescuing you from eternity of punishment in hell, then no amount of giving is ever too much for him to provide for all that you need. You cannot outgive God. You will never be able to. He will always keep his promise and provide for everything that you need. Jesus, sending out the disciples in the New Testament, told them how they were going to be provided for. If you were Jesus at that point, what would you have done? How would you have provided for the needs of those disciples? He could have sent them out with the saving gospel and provided for them in any way that he wanted to. He could have said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all all creation and surely I'm going to send those ravens to be with you to feed you with bread and meat in the morning and evening. He could have told them, that way you'll be perfectly and completely dependent on me at all times. You won't have to worry. 
You'll always be taken care of. But God chooses to act differently than we might think. He has chosen in his church to provide for those who share the gospel through the generous hearts of those who hear the good news. He has chosen to use your temporal blessings that he gives you for a short time in this life to provide for the preaching of the gospel around the world. He has given all of us the privilege of supporting the good news of the gospel and sending out missionaries all around the world. It is God who has chosen to bless us this way with this great privilege. If it were me, I may have chosen a different way. But our Heavenly Father knows best. And in His gracious wisdom, He has chosen to give us this great blessing. And when we trust in Him, we are blessed and have all that we need. Amen. Please stand. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen.